Um, I think we're ready to start if you are Damien. Um, so good morning everybody and welcome to the webinar this morning which has been um, generously presented by Dr. Damien Noon who is um, part of the nephrology team here at um, SickKids um, and he'll be giving us a talk on um, chronic kidney disease and the, the journey from this to end-stage renal disease. Um, please remember that if you have any questions, there's a chat box at the bottom. Um, with me on the screen here is Dr. Joanna DeSantos, who's um, one of our team nephrologists. Um, we'll answer questions as you go, um, or um, Damien can answer them at the end. Thank you, Damien. No problem. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for, for asking me to talk to, to you uh, urologists. Um, and I'm going to talk about CKD and end-stage renal disease. Um, and, and some of the some of the journey that 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 involves. Um, so, as a sort of a basic outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just the importance of CKD on a on a sort of a global level, just to remind people of, of how important it is, and look specifically at the epidemiology of chronic kidney disease in children. A little bit about what CKD is. Um, a little bit about. Um, the normal attainment of GFR. So that's when you're, you know, from it's the early neonatal, the first two years, because they're very important because you gain some kidney kidney function, obviously. Even if you have bad kidneys, you gain kidney function. And there's a study that uh, clearly shows that. And so it's important to fight for those uh, nephrons, even when you have a, uh, a dismal looking um, situation. And that's where the nephrologists are always uh, begging the urologists to, to try and do something to, to save the nephrons. Um, and then what goes up must come down. So, you know, even though we do gain kidney, you gain GFR over time, you lose GFR. And sometimes it goes down faster. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, morbidity, mortality in, in pediatric CKD. Because you guys are primarily uh, urologists. You're not as keen about learning about glomerular nephritis and all glomerular disease and the causes of, of things of uh, renal impairment. So I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on CACUT and some, some work, in fact, that I had the, the honor of being involved with with the, the local team here. Um, and maybe if there's time, some basic tenets of just CKD management and a few principles that we as nephrologists uh, uh, do. So the estimated global prevalence of CKD ranges from about 9 to 11 to 12 percent. You can see that everywhere all over the world pretty much the same prevalence. And 80 percent of all patients receiving treatment for end-stage renal disease, however, are from developed countries. And one in ten people worldwide will develop chronic kidney disease in their lifetime. If you look at the global prevalence of renal replacement therapy, though, you see a huge inequity and disparity where the prevalence of people, you know, people are getting dialysis in North America and Europe, but there are a lot of places where there, you know, there's no data or people are just not getting dialysis. And so despite there being an equal amount of uh, renal or CKD and end-stage renal disease across the world, there's a complete inequity in those getting dialysis. And that's probably because renal replacement therapy is expensive and often on the tail, completely unattainable in developing countries. Um, the developed countries um, spend two to three percent of their healthcare expenditure providing treatment for patients with end stage renal disease, and these patients just account for 0.1 to 0.2 percent of the population. But if you look at the states, apparently Medicare spending for all CKD rose from 41 billion to 50 billion, a 22% increase in cost um, in just four years in the last decade. And the total cost of CKD care in the US in 2013 exceeded the entire national budgets of many countries. Um, more recently, it has come out that CKD is actually now the 12th, it has moved from, from being the 25th to the 15th to now the 12th leading cause of death globally in, in 2017. And the global prevalence, as I had said, was like 9%, somewhere between you know, 9 and 12%, roughly 700 million cases worldwide. And that has been a 30% increase since 1990. So the total are there, and then the, the buildup of them, the vast majority of them are, are, are in the CKD 1 to 2, 
which is probably okay, these in CKD3 are at risk of progressing to all these other stages. And what about the mortality in adults now with end-stage kidney disease? So five-year survival on dialysis is just 40 to 50%. Um, this guy in China um, made his own dialysis mach machine and hooked, or hooked it up and managed to keep himself alive for 13 years on dialysis. But life expectancy on dialysis is one third that of the age matched and sex matched general population. However, if you have a transplant, it's much better. Five year survival with transplant is 86%. If it's a deceased donor, 93% with living donor. And life expectancy is 45 to 85% of that of the general population for those who receive kidney transplant. So kidney transplant is much better, so, but we all know that. And if you put that in per perspective, here's sort of survival uh, probability curves, um, where you have pancreas, lung, dialysis, colorectal, and breast. So these are all cancers in dialysis. Can you guess which, uh, which one is dialysis? Which color do you think is the dialysis one? So the dialysis one is, is apart from um, pancreas and lung cancer, it, they are worse than it. It's a pretty dismal um, um, diagnosis and, and life expectancy. All right, so let's look at the epidemiology of chronic kidney disease in children. It's all the natural history. So the, the mean incidence uh, is about 12 cases per million. Um, with a point prevalence of 74 per million at the age of the age-related population. And that's from an Italian huge, um, huge data uh, database. And then if you look at what are the main causes, well, hypodysplasia with an identified uropathy and no urinary tract malformations um, in all patients and end-stage renal disease are, are some of the biggest, um, the biggest problems and they're where urologists come in. And you see the same etiological pattern in, in children on renal replacement therapy. The vast majority are, are cacid, followed by glomerulonephritis and then all the other things. So it's easy enough for the urologists, they just need to know cacid. Um, and that's why we, we're so dependent on the urologists as nephrologists, because uh, uh, this is our, the main, the main cause of, of our problems. And if you looked at urinary tract malformations associated with hypodysplasia in children with chronic renal failure, again, the vast majority are caused by reflux and valves. Looking at estimated kidney survival in children with chronic kidney disease by age, the probability of kidney survival by age 20 is dependent on, on, G, on GFR. So you have a good chance if your GFR is above 50, you have a 63% uh, chance of survival. And these are, are all children. Um, versus if it's less than 25, you know, you're not by age 20, they're, they're, they're doomed. So the more GFR you have, the better. The overall population is 68%. So in all their children with all forms of renal disease in, in, their, in their database, 68% probability of the, they will survive to the age 20 without needing uh, dialysis or transplant. There is a steep decline noted in uh, renal survival during puberty and early post-puberty, leading almost 70% of patients to end-stage renal failure by the, by the age of 20. So ultimately, um, we all know as well that puberty is a, is a big challenge. Um, in Europe, the incidence of pediatric end-stage renal disease was 5.7 per million um, age-related population in children aged 0 to 14, and the prevalence was 32. In the United States, the incidence and prevalence is 14.7 and 103 for the age group of 0 to 21. All right, so it's, um, let's talk about what is, is CKD then. So, CKD is defined by a glomerular filtration rate of less than 60 mL per minute for 1.73 meters squared, albuminuria of at least 30 mg per 24 hours, or markers of kidney damage, example, hematuria or structural abnormalities, such as polycystic or dysplastic kidneys, persisting for more than um, three months. 
And if you were to look at what are some of the mechanisms or pathophysiology of chronic kidney disease, some, some of the primary mechanisms are you lose nephrons, you don't have enough nephrons, so they hypertrophy, so nephron hypertrophy, impaired glomerular filtration, or scarring. And some contributing factors are prematurity and low birth weight. And this is uh, you know, quite, a, quite a big problem or, that's emerging. Um, lots of babies born premature with not as, uh, as full uh, an endowment of nephrons. Um, some genetic factors, obesity, pregnancy uh, can accelerate renal uh, failure, diabetes, AKI, and just good old fashioned aging. Um, so some of the theories around um, chronic kidney disease in, involve injury, hyperfiltration, and hypertrophy of the nephron. So you have um, a kidney that, it, or a, a, a filter that initially tries to compensate. Um, you get uh, hyperfiltration and hypertension. And then because of release of sort of, I, I view them as, you know, they're, they're trying to strengthen up the kidney and these, you know, profibrotic um, cytokines and you end up with hypertrophy and ultimately with fibrosis um, and loss of, of podocytes. And you also get interstitial, interstitial fibrosis. So that scarring uh, in between, in the interstitial between all the tubules and loss of, um, and you get tubular atrophy. So you get proteinuria, uh, tubular cell stress and activation and cell loss and then scars and then compensatory hypertrophy of the tubules to try and, um, and battle, but it, it all fails. And in terms of classifying um, uh, CKD, the National Kidney Foundation's Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative or NKDOKI classification of CKD looks at whether it looks on the, at the GFR and proteinuria. So there's normal to mildly increased proteinuria, moderately increased proteinuria, or severely increased uh, proteinuria. And then the GFR, whether it's greater than 90, greater than 60, or as you can see down to greater than four and, four and five. And this, these group do really well. So your GFR is above 60 and you have no proteinuria, it looks really good for you. Um, and then it gets progressively worse as you go down these stages. And obviously you're doomed if you have a lot more proteinuria as well as a low GFR. We'll come back to that in a, in a while. So I want to just, just look now at the uh, normal development and attainment of kidney function. So the early years. So going back, right back into the, into the womb, the nephrogenesis begins around nine weeks. And 60% of nephrons are formed during the third trimester. So the entire nephron complement is determined by 36 weeks. And an extreme preterm infant, infants, if you're born here in the 20, nephron, uh, nephrogenesis ceases around 40 days after, after birth. So if you're, you, these are your, uh, number of nephrons and if you're born at term you're born with your full sort of complement or number of nephrons but if you're born down here in the preterm you you're not born with the same number of, of nephrons you do continue for a little longer to make nephrons but it's not quite as good as when they're in the womb so they they may gain a little more when they come out at this in this 24 week but they're not and they're only they're going to end up with a quarter the number of, of nephrons. So nephron numbers matter and they, and they vary. Uh, they vary between um, black individuals and white individuals. They increase um, for every kilogram increase in birth weight. Um, they're lower in women. Um, and every, every year you go past 18, you start losing them. You gain, you gain more nephrons if you're taller. And um, for in infants, for every gram of more of kidney tissue you have, you have, you have more nephrons. So and these nephrons um, are important. If you look in the, 
this is how nephrons, they're almost like they're laid down in layers. Um, it's like akin to like the layers in a, in a, in a tree. So these nephrons, the more, uh, these are the latest nephrons to be laid down. If you're born premature, this is what you're left with. These immature, immature glomeruli and not, not the full amount of nephrons. So the creatinine clearance um, and kidney function in, in neonates is, um, is really quite, quite low, uh, particularly if you're born earlier too. And if the creatinine clearance is low, then your creatinine is obviously higher. So this is in milligram per deciliter, so multiply these by 88.4. But um, initially, that's why the uh, baby's, newborn baby's creatinine is, is higher. And in terms of GFR in babies during fetal life, GFR increases from about 14 at 32 weeks to 21 at term. So 21 is not, not pretty good, and that's why a lot of these neonates uh, um, have such poor kidney function at the start, and then if they have an additional problem on top of it, they're in, they're in a lot of trouble. However, GFR doubles by week two of age, and you achieve adult values, it's thought by the age of about two. And the rate of GFR uh, maturation is a function related to post-conceptual conceptual age and not postnatal age. So there's a postnatal rise in GFR in preterm infants is slower. That's what I was um, saying earlier. So if you're born at term, the, you know, in two weeks, the GFR doubles, goes from like 20, 25 to 50. If you're born preterm, it does not increase as much. So prematurity is, is, not, is not good for attainment of GFR and the born premature, they end up uh, uh, not doing as, as well from a, from a kidney perspective. Okay, so what goes up must come down. So if you have a GFR that rises, um, it, it may, also, may also fall. So looking at the rate of GFR decline in chronic kidney disease, it's not exactly straightforward, um, but it can be somewhat predictable. So on average, the estimated GFR decreases by about four mils per uh, minute per 1.73 meters squared per year in children with chronic kidney disease. Um, when you look at age, the GFR in a healthy adult, 20 to 40, is around 107 and declines at a rate of 0.7 mils per minute for 1.73 meters squared per year. By age 75, many otherwise healthy individuals will have lost 50% of the nephrons and the GFR will be half that of when they were 25 years of age. So that's not good. You can see here that the higher your, your GFR is, the, the better, because if you're losing, you're losing GFR by the time you are 70, if you have lower GFR, it's just normal, normal sort of, these are people with normal uh, ranges of GFR, um, you're much more likely to lose, to lose kidney function just with age. So you don't want to grow up. Okay, so which falls faster, a hammer or a feather? What, what, what does that mean? So it's an interesting YouTube video of the guy in the moon when he had the hammer and the feather and he dropped the two of them to see which falls faster. It's, I'll not, I'll not uh, ruin the surprise for you, I'll let you go find it. Um, but the reason I talk about this is um, do, you know, depending on your kidney disease that you have, does the GFR fall at the same rate or, or fall at different rates? And of course it falls at different rates. So this study was done in Great Ormond Street and it's still a very, it's a study we often talk about and, and um, uh, quote uh, three well-defined time periods um, in, in, GF, in GFR and kidney failure. And this, this studied uh, children with uh, dysplastic kidneys and neurological uh, problems and looked at the progression of renal failure. So during the first year of life, 82% of the children showed, showed that early improvement of their kidney function, which actually lasted until the median age of 3.2 years. 
So that's what I've talked about in a normal neonate. Um, you know, the GFR doubles at two weeks, and then by the time they're two, it's up to adults. So you're gaining kidney function. This is this study showed that that actually goes even maybe even goes even further, but up to like three years. So it's definitely those first few years are really important uh, for gaining kidney function. And this is this cohort is a cohort of kids with urological disease. So this is not normal kids. These are all our Kakut and um, kids in, in general with a median improvement of six mils per year. And then from the age of three until 11, about half of the children showed pretty stable kidney function, whereas about half of them, the kidney function starts to deteriorate. And so that's why we sort of go, if you can get out of that you know, neonatal period without needing dialysis, there's a good chance you'll gain some kidney function over the first couple of years. So you'll stay fairly stable. And then, and so you, you get out of that first year and then, you know, up until puberty, so from this age three to, to 11, it's probably 50-50. Most will stay along running a fairly stable course, but some will go off. And then around puberty, a similar kind of thing. About 40% started de deteriorate, uh, deteriorating, whereas 57% showed stable function. And that's where we, as nephrologists or urologists, when you, you find someone that have gotten through puberty and they still have a stable GFR, well, then they're good to go again. It's like you have these, these um, periods. And in this study, they showed like, you know, some, there's like different patterns. So the, the hammer and the feather don't fall um, the same. Um, here's like, you know, a pattern where you gain GFR, you gain GFR. Here's one where it just declines straight from the start. And here's like a fairly stable, you know, straight line all the time. And they put it, so you gain the function 50-50, some lose it and some keep going until you until you hit puberty um, and then uh, um, and then you uh, it stays stable until you you can see the the number who are who are dropping off and, and rate of decline there um and what, what might make the GFR deteriorate more quickly? Well, from this study, patients with protein greater than 200 deteriorated faster. Their drop was like minus 6.5 mils per minute for 1.73 meters squared, um, compared with minus 1.5 uh, in those with the proteinuria less than 50. So that's what I had already mentioned to you, that proteinuria uh, can make things deteriorate faster. They found in this study that more than two febrile UTIs, they also found hypertension, and they found that the EGFR, if it was less than 40 at the beginning, they were more likely to deteriorate faster, and obviously during puberty, as we said. Um, <coughs> in this study, um, this study combined two, two big cohorts, the uh, CKID trial and the ESCAPE trial. Um, and it, it basically included um, over a thousand, over a thousand uh, patients, 1,232 patients to be precise, and looked at sort of six stages with varying um, combinations of GFR and proteinuria. Just like the, you know, the first graph I showed you of the, of the, of the um, GFR and the, the Kedoki classification. And they looked at the predictors of EGFR and proteinuria, and they looked at their outcome was a composite of renal replacement therapy, a 50% reduction in GFR, or EGFR less than 50. Um, and basically, children with uh, glomerular disease were estimated to have a 43% shorter time to event than non glomerular. And you can see that if you have the no protein, you have a higher GFR with no protein, the green ones, you're doing you're doing, you're doing better. And you can see that the glomerular ones uh, do, a, do a little worse. And so the median time to event, as I said, was the, uh, the outcome, ranged from longer than 10 years for EGFRs of 45 to 90, and urine protein creatinine ratio of less than 0.5 milligram per milligram, 
to 0 0.8 years, so less than a year for EGFRs of 15 to 30 and significant proteinuria. So proteinuria and GFR are very, very good markers of, um, of GFR decline. Um, so the other, this next study looks at, um, uh, at, at a nonlinear trajectory of GFR in children before renal replacement therapy. We all we always find that you know that or we we wonder or we think that you know that GFR declines nice and slowly, um, you know, in a predictable way, and we we're waiting and we're like, okay, I I think we can maybe we should initiate you know the pre-transplant to try and preemptively transplant them or whatever, but then suddenly whoop the GFR just declines more rapidly and you don't you don't get to do that preemptive transplant. Um, and it's and it's very hard to 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 predict. And in this study, um, they found that this is your case. This is your con they had controls um, who went with CKD and who did not go to dialysis, and those who went to dialysis. And they looked at them from whenever they begin began follow up and to the 18 months, this is the 18 months prior to initiation of dialysis right here. So at the time they started dialysis and the 18 months before it and looked at the 18 months or looked at the, from, from like the first time they were followed up until 18 months be before, you know, that final 18 months before they um, um, ended up needing dialysis. And basically from study entry, to 18 months before renal replacement therapy, GFR was declining 7% faster among cases compared with controls. But during the 18 months before renal replacement therapy commenced, GFR declined 26% faster among cases compared with controls. So, you, so in this, this is 18 months before, in the cases, it's it suddenly takes a drop. It's already declining faster. So if you spot a, a, a GFR that's declining, it's um, fast, you know, like fairly fast, it can at some point just dip and sort of drop. Okay. Any questions? So, no, no questions so far. Um, Okie doke. So, I'm going to move on now to look at um, pediatric survival uh, versus mortality. So the overall five-year survival in uh, rate in European children starting on dialysis is 89.5%. So almost 90% five-year survival in European children starting on dialysis. The overall mort mortality rate is 28 deaths per 1,000 patient years. And mortality is highest, 36 during the first year of dialysis and in the zero to five year age group where it's up to 50 per thousand. So the overall is about 28. If you're in that uh, needing, um, needing dialysis in the first five years, you're in a much higher death rate and your risk of death is highest in the first year of dialysis. And kind of like adults, cardiovascular events and infections are the main causes of death. And how does that compare to the general pediatric population? So mortality in children with end-stage renal disease is uh, still 55 times higher than in the general pediatric population and occurs predominantly in the dialysis population. And factors shown to affect the mortality risk of the pediatric renal replacement therapy include age of renal replacement therapy initiation, transplantation, time on renal replacement therapy, the primary renal disease, and comorbidity. So, if dialysis, uh, this is your incidence of mortality, it's higher if dialysis has started earlier than five versus over five. And HD is associated with a higher mortality over PD, and there's better survival with PD over HD um, in those over, over age five. 
And survival has been improving though over the past 30 years. So we're getting better at this. If those aged less than five at end stage renal disease treatment initiation in this is 2005 to 2010, so the more, more recent cohort, better survival than back in 1990. An age greater than five, it's also better, but the, they had less of an improvement to make, but it's still better. And survival during the initial course of dialysis according to the age which chronic PD was initiated for treatment of end-stage renal disease. Looking at age, age at dialysis, if you started in that first year, the, the um, patient survival is much less. So dialysis in the first year of life is not good. Um, a second year of life is a little bit better, but really, if you need dialysis, you don't want to be starting it until you're a little older. Um, and the more recent cohort, this has gotten is this has gotten a lot better. And this terrible, terrible graph has 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 come right up. So dialysis in the first, it's still worse. It's the worst and the most difficult, but it has gotten significantly better than in the nineties. How about the really small ones? Because these are the ones that uh, are, the, are sometimes the toughest. So survival of infants less than one month. So the one in five year survival rates of 52 and 48% for 41 infants less than 28 days old treated with peritoneal dialysis. So you have a 50-50 chance of survival if you, if you end up needing dialysis in the first month of life as a neonate. So it's 50-50. That's American data, but what about up here in, 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 in Canada? So this is an interesting study of survival and transplant outcomes across Canada, all, all Canadian centers um, in the under twos. And there's a total of 87 patients, 69% were male, and they had a median follow-up of almost five years. Um, and you can see that 85 started uh, dialysis in the under two, and Two had a preemptive tra transplant. PD was the most common initial renal replacement therapy, occurring in, in almost 85%. Um, and we can see that 57% and 65% were transplanted at two, two and a half years, basically, somewhere between two and three years of age. And 490 patient years of follow up. 26% deaths and 22 occurred in the, in the non-transplanted patients. So mortality is greater if renal replacement therapy started at zero to three months. So if your age group is in the zero to less than three, there's 30 patients, the number of deaths is 36%, number of transplants at 46%. Three months to a year, the number of deaths is down to 27%, 66 make it to transplant. And if you're in the first year to the second year, 12% deaths. So it's like, you know, it's getting progressively better and more are gonna, are gonna be transplanted. That's the Canadian data. And we also know that survival is worse if you have comorbidities. So chronic uh, renal replacement therapy in infants with chronic renal failure in the first year of life with and without comorbidities, um, have an extra, ex carry an extra baggage is not good. Um, and we seem to be dialyzing more, uh, more complex patients. So the percentage of end renal patients less than four years of age and on dialysis with greater than one comorbidity has increased. The answer is true. So 3.9% with more than one comorbidity from 1990 to 94 versus 31% with more than one comorbidity from 2005 to 2010. So if you believe as, as urologists that oh my God, we're trying to do dialysis and the nephrologists and the neonatologists are asking to, us to do dialysis on these infants with um, severe heart disease and other things. It's pretty true. We're, we're, um, we're seeing their, with their better ventilatory techniques and their high frequency oscillatory ventilation, nitric oxide, we're even seeing that, oops, a lot of these, you know, we used to say when we would be canceling these, uh, mothers, for instance, antenatally, that will all depend on the lungs, and if the neonatologists can't keep the baby alive because the lungs are, are so bad, the neonatologists have gotten pretty good at keeping the babies alive. So we're left with these babies and the lungs. They often end up, let's you know, in severely 
uh, difficult ventilation or whatever for a little while, but then they're, then they're left with the, the bad kidneys. But what's the price we pay if we, if we do go down this route of offering dialysis and, and doing that? Um, well, the main price, I told you you have a 50-50% chance of making it, but then that's, that's, that's one thing. But then there's a neurological price, perhaps. And the neurological outcome of me and dialysis. Um, in this study, there's like 71% of neurological abnormalities. And about 30% of them are major, ranging from cerebral palsy to hearing de deficits and cognitive disability to more minor things from like ADHD, different things. And we've, we, we see that in, in a lot of our kids um, who have neonates. We see sort of autistic type features in some of them that have been on dialysis from, from neonates. And some of them do absolutely, absolutely perfect and they're running around and, and doing really well. And it's, it's really difficult uh, to predict which ones are, are going to. This is an interesting study where they looked at um, those with hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, liver disease, and re renal disease. So, so the burden of a chronic, chronic childhood illness, um, and um, and whether or not there is like uh, worse neurocognitive outcome, and just uh, and it's and it's not if in end stage renal disease you have more. Uh, more likelihood to get chronic or neurological problems, neuro neurocognitive deficits. So it's, there's something more to it than just the, and the same with liver disease, um, and also with dialysis versus being on transplant. So there's something additional. It's not just chronic, a chronic disease causing, uh, you know, they're not going to school or neurocognitive. There's something else in it. Um, so talking about CACUJ, the most common uh, primary disease in children, but accounts for only 2% of all renal replacement therapy patients in, in like, you know, huge, in all, all people who get um, dialysis. And most CACUJ patients reach end-stage renal disease at adult age, actually, with a median age of renal replacement therapy being 31. And they have better survival compared to non-CACUJ. Um, so look at our most our most common um if you like uh urological uh, um, thing is obstructive uropathy and so can we predict the renal outcome in obstructive uropathy where you have this uh with valves and in fact can you uh predict the future and this is something that people have been working working on a lot um and you know some of these things are like, you know, the creatinine at age one or whatever, but trying to figure out something way before that is much more important. And there was this interesting study looking at the renal parenchymal area and risk of end-stage renal disease in boys with posterior urethral valves. So the rate of time to end-stage renal disease was 10 times higher when the renal parenchymal area was less than 12.4 uh, versus greater than 12.4. And renal parenchymal area could best discriminate children at risk for end stage renal disease when the minimum creatinine in the first month of life was between 0.8 and 1, or 70 and 97. So you can see that if you have much better survival, if your renal parenchymal area, so you have quantity, looks like it's better. So Armando Lorenzo here had the wonderful idea of. Um, quantity versus quality. So renal parenchymal area is, if you like, quantity. Um, but what about the quality? We, are, we always look, and you guys are probably the same from a urology, you look at the cortical medullary differentiation and how echogenic it is and whether or not there's like cysts. And you know a kidney that looks better than a kidney that doesn't, so quality. So you might have a lot of area, but is it good quality? And um, he did this very interesting study where looking at the echogenicity and the cortical medullary differentiation as well as the renal parenchymal area and found that, uh, you know, validated the, the previous study showing that the renal parenchymal area if was much, obviously was greater in those with CKD, with no CKD5 versus those that were, but also found that the cortical medullary differentiation index, and it's just a ratio of the echogenicity between the cortex and the medulla, and the echogenicity index is the echogenicity between the kidney versus the liver, and also found that that was the same. 
renal length is highly collinear with renal parenchymal area, um, but it was uh, not. And the serum creatinine, again, yes, at one year, but waiting a year to try and prognosticate for parents is, is more difficult. So he also so showed that the, the renal parenchymal area greater than 12.4, much better survival. He also showed, though, that if your um, outcome is worse, if both kidneys, uh, both kidneys are echogenic as opposed to one kidney, one or no, none of the kidneys being echogenic. So having a non-echogenic kidney and was better as well. And also the cortical medullary differentiation might actually be better than renal parenchymal area at predicting outcome. And the cortical medullary differentiation index is declines you know with the worse worse uh, kidney as kidney function decreases and then actually um, somebody asked a question about uh, oh should we be doing something about those uh, you know those valves you know that's remember I said the first three years or the first two to three years are very important um, and you should be trying to protect protect nephrons and so doing something about it, that's where the, the nephrologists are often like, oh, we should be doing something about it. And this is another interesting study of uh, Dr. Bagley um, and Mike, Michael, uh, who's one of our co-hosts, uh, authored this, looking at the impact of urinary diversion versus valve ablation alone on progression from CKD to end-stage renal disease. And interestingly, in the first year, there was there looks like there's a difference, okay? If you do no ablation versus you do ablation and some kind of diversion, be that vasocostomy or your drastomies, pilostomies, that there is a survival, uh, you know, a, a slow, a slower rate to, or time to end stage renal disease. But if when you go out to 15 years, um, at 15 years, there is no difference. So it's, it's, it's hard to know how to look at that. It's like, you know, if we do, whether we divert, don't divert, or whether we just do the, the valve ablation, in 15 years, it's all going to be the same. They're all, you know, there's no difference. But there is a difference in that first time. So maybe in that first, first time, and I've told you that mortality is much better in neonates who, or who don't end up on dialysis. So I think in the first couple of years, it is important to fight for them and do something. So although it doesn't appear to show a difference in the end, that could be all just statistics. Um, um, so that's a, that's a question for you, you, you urologists to figure out the right answer to um, in the end. So to summarize that little section, quality is more important than quantity. One home run is much better than two doubles. So in other words, one, one, uh, one, bright, one normal kidney is much better than two kidneys with uh, you know, echogenic or whatever. Who said, any idea who said this? Was it Armando Lorenzo? Nope, it was actually Steve Jobs. But Armando could have said the same thing because he discovered the same thing. All right, so the timing and outcome of renal replacement therapy in patients with CACUT. Um, looking, at, looking at this, this is where I told you that, you know, um, 31 is the median age um, for uh, CACUT uh, needing dialysis as opposed to other diagnoses. So, um, patients with CACUT end up okay, going on dialysis be before, in general, and looking at all, this is uh, 200, over 200,000 um, people who end up on dialysis. And if you look at this, if you just focus on this yellow line, this is the dysplasia. So these are the ones that are most likely to go on dialysis earlier. And then if then there's this reflux pile, reflux pile and nephritis are more likely, you know, they increase um, in this, you know, in the second decade. And if you look, so this is almost this bimodal thing for these um, CACUT. And if you look at dysplasia again, the cumulative incidence of patients starting with replacement therapy is worse with those with dysplasia. Um, and then looking at patient survival during renal replacement therapy in patients with CACUT, in non-CACUT, the patient's survival is down here. But in patients with CACUT, um, it's much better survival. 
The interesting ones that don't do so well are the neurogenic pyelonephritis. And if you look at graft and patient survival in those uh, who have been transplanted with CACUT, CACUT in general do better. So graft and graft and patient survival better in CACUT versus non-CACUT. Um, so in preparing for kidney, kidney transplant, uh, there's always a question about starting dialysis versus preemptive kidney transplant is associated with a six-fold increase um, in mortality. So you want to, the preemptive transplant is better. And that's why it's, we're always trying to guess when should we do it. And that's when that, you know, that rate of decline um, if, of kidney function is, is really important to be watching. You know, as I told you in that 18 months up to them needing dialysis, you will notice a much more rapid decline. So if you're not noticing a more rapid decline in kidney function than has been going on, um, it's, that's when you need to be uh, beginning to act, but it's not always possible. Um, and vascular morbidity is reduced in preemptive transplantation as compared with patients undergoing dialysis. Um, and this is like a, a things like in pulse wave velocity and in carotid intima medial thickness and left ventricular mass index. So um, you are you are better uh, to be to be transplanted um, in terms of endothelial and vascular uh, vascular function. Okay, so so some very simple. Um, basic things that we that we look at and, and do in our um, CKD. Um, we're, we're wanting to control further nephron injury, so that's why we, we are always fighting for um, people to you know, preserve nephrons, you know, don't allow any further nephron injury, particularly in the, in the babies, the newborns, and those that first two to maybe three years where you're trying, uh, hoping that they'll gain that little bit of function and or glomerular filtration uh, reserve that they that you have. Um, we also work on normalizing single nephron hyperfiltration, and if they're proteinuria, we do that with an ACE, ACE inhibition and controlling blood pressure. And then we also want to control all the CKD-related complications and prepare the the kidney they are the patient for kidney replacement therapy. Um, and these are all the things that the nephrologists are playing with, fluid and electrolyte abnormalities, anemia, CKD, bone, mineral bone disease, acidosis, hyperuricemia, hypertension, anemia, endocrine dysfunction, and, and lipidemia. But we are also, as I said, man trying to manage the uh, modifiable progression factors, so hypertension and proteinuria, which incidentally are not as severe initially um, at all in the CACUT patients. It's a much more longer or later finding than in the Myrna diseases. Um, hypertension, and we know from the ESCAPE um, study, European study, uh, looking at strict control of blood pressure um, and chronic renal failure progression, using ACE inhibition shows that getting that blood pressure down to the 50th percentile um, can slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. And we're also trying to make sure that they don't um, develop obesity. And then we have learned that the earlier the better. Um, we've learned this from Alport's, which is a slowly progressive glomerular disorder where you get proteinuria and proteinuria chronic kidney disease, that if you get in with uh, with therapy and the ACE inhibition, you can push off the time for dialysis by 10 to 20 years, um, and even out to like 40 years. So versus you wait around for those patients with Alports to get proteinuria, and then you start your ACE inhibition, it's much, it's much worse. Uh, it's a much more rapid time to dialysis. So we are, we are always wanting to uh, get them on um, dialysis or on ACE inhibition manage the proteinuria um, to, prevent, to prevent dialysis in the, in the future. Um, all right, so 
I can stop there. Um, in fact, though, I will I was going to stop there, but I have a few more slides on um, on just measuring because it's something that um, that I'll I'll just quickly go through their their things measuring and estimating GFR and how how we do it. Um, because I'm I'm quite early, I went quickly through this. I guess with nobody able to interrupt me per se, I can waffle on rapidly. Um, so. GFR is measured by quantified by measuring the prep and clearance of a, sub, of a substance and the ideal marker must have a stable concentration, be filtered, not reabsorbed, secreted, synthesized or metabolized. Um, and we, we use the, you know, the clearance uh, looking at the urinary concentration and versus the urinary flow rate and the plasma concentration. But what we do uh, is the bedside Schwartz formula, so the eGFR is 36 times 36 0.5 times the height and divided by the, the creatinine, with the creatinine here is in micromoles per liter. Um, there's another way of measuring it with statin C. We don't have that at sick kids, but some pl places do because it's better than um, creatinine. And there are a couple of also, uh, if you guys are doing any of your studies um, and you don't have heights, because a lot of the, um, when you've seen patients, and they have been in clinic, they often don't have their height measured. There's ways of measuring GFR or estimating GFR without knowing the height. So it can be a, an easy um, thing to do. All right, I'll stop there for sure. Damien, that was excellent. Um, Saban, he had a question about uh, the conservative management about UPJ and, and how do you think this can affect uh, the overall kidney function and the future uh, kidney function? But I think you already commented on it. I don't know if you want to expand that. Yeah, so, so I guess it's, we think that we, if it's in the, in the first few years of life, I think it's, you know, um, there is, we're gaining kidney function. So anything that's stopping you from gaining that kidney function, be that, uh, you know, UPJ or something, um, then maybe it's, maybe it's not so good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so we're, we're, and that's where we're always, Joanna will know and Karen will, you know, in the end stage rounds, we have our most famous nephrologist here, Elizabeth Harvey, who, <laughs> the Lorax yeah. of the, <laughs> Nef Lorax of the nephron, and she's like, please, please do something and stop this, you know, we need to do something because these nephrons are, you know, we don't want pressure, we don't want obstruction, we don't, you know, um, and from Dr. Tullis from Great Ormond Street from that study, it's even up to three years, you know, you're gaining function, so, yeah, so. We think you should be doing something, I guess. Um, so Mandy was just asking if we could see the last slide again um, for estimating GFR without height. Oh yeah, I'm sure I can. I can just send her, I'll, yeah. Mandy is here, I'll just send you the, the, the talk. Yeah, I think, um, so yeah. Those, yeah, and it will be recorded. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to comment on like, you know, the issue of the sort of the drastic decompression measures, you know, the ureterostomies and the basic ostomies and how mm -hmm. that's always been so interesting, you know, when you do look at Mike's study that, you know, they time to, uh, to the end event, which is dialysis isn't changed, but, you know, practically speaking, when you're dealing with these patients, the ones who end up getting these drastic measures, um, we're not at the same starting point as those who didn't. So, you know, you've got this patient in ICU who's got uranomas and it's just not peeing and you're almost like, you can't not do it. And that's the problem is that we don't, well, maybe we do somewhere, but we don't know about them, have a trial of children who really were so badly obstructed that a bell ablation was not enough for them. Um, and they didn't get those. And I, I think we probably do buy them a little bit of the subgroup of patients who really have high grade upper tract obstruction. We do buy them a bit of time with our um, extreme measures. I think so. And I think when I was, I was lucky enough to be on that paper with those guys and they, uh, you know, I remember uh, Dar Darius, I think he was saying, look, it's the same at 15 years. It doesn't matter, you know, we're doing all these things and it doesn't matter. You know, it's yes, it's doing something at the beginning, but it's not 
And then I was like, but that beginning is an important point because if you can, you know, because if you end up on dialysis, you know, in the first, you know, you, the, the biggest mortality in children with end-stage on dialysis is in that first year on dialysis, right? So, you, and the mortality is is huge. You'd be 50-50 if you're as a neonate and you end up on dialysis and or whatever. So getting them getting them out of that first year, even if you, if whatever you're doing, getting them out. I don't know if that study was the, is the, is able to answer that or if somebody has done that study more and it probably obviously needs a prospective you know well-designed study and putting equal apples and oranges together not you know not retrospectively trying to look because as you said there's probably different factors in the NICU or in whatever that that make us do them and different practice things but I, I, think, I don't know, for sort of me also as a urologist, what's sometimes difficult is the older patients. So if you've got a seven year old who's now starting to kind of fall down that hill, is that the time to start doing like drastic upper tract things like ureterostomies and pilostomies at that point? And yeah, that, that's probably less for me. I would be less kind of going, yeah, you should be doing something, you know, because if they're, if they're going, um, but, but I don't know that, you know, because they, their survival is much better on dialysis and whatever at that stage, it's, it's, it's very good. Yeah. I don't know. Um, Dr. Bagley says not a question, but it would be interesting to relook that, um, that study doing the fragility index. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Mandy's research where they, yeah, fragility indexes when you, um, how sick they are kind of. No, you take the numbers in your different cohorts and you see how many you need to like tip over into the other result group to make your p value sort of lose its oh, value. Advanced um, statistics. Yeah, advanced statistics. Well, very fast is the p value basically. Yeah. yeah, 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 cool. No, yeah. No. Um, are there any other questions or comments? I can also hand the mic to anybody who would like it. Um, if not, I'm going to thank Dr. Noon for his time this morning um, and for the very good talk. Um, it's always um, nice to have you guys with us um, and yeah, to see the, the other side of the blood brain barrier. Um, so when, and this talk is recorded um, and we'll upload it to our YouTube channel and I'll make that link available as soon as it's ready. Um, yeah. As long as Dr. Noon is happy with it. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> um, yeah. I haven't said anything too controversial. Dr. Bagley, I apologize if I have offended you. <laughs> yeah, it's just forever now. I apologize to Armando for using his picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Damien. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.